Today in this podcast, I wish to bring up a subject that I have found rather fascinating ever since I first found out about the subject, and that subject is the Scots language. When I first found out about this language, I was in high school. At the time, I was someone who liked to walk through the bookstores in the foreign language section to see what kind of books they had. I was in a Barnes & Noble walking through their foreign language section when I saw something called the Hippocrene Practical Dictionary of Scots English English Scots. Reading that, I was thinking, okay, what the heck is Scots? I was confused. Everyone knew that in Scotland everybody spoke English, and maybe a few people spoke Gaelic as part of their tradition. The first thing that I did as I went and I immediately looked up the term in the Oxford English Dictionary. We find the definition of Scots, the form of English used in Scotland. Think, okay, what does Webster have to say about it? And the Webster's Dictionary says the English language of Scotland. So what does that mean? Does that mean that it's just English of Scotland with a Scottish accent with one or two little quirks to it? It sounds as though it is just what we might call Scottish Standard English. Yet, if we look through the Hippocrene Dictionary, the very beginning of the book makes it clear that that's not the case. Looking at several words, one also sees the spellings and the pronunciations that are quite different. If you look at these words, some of them are similar enough to English that you would probably understand what they meant. But if any of you have spoken or learned Spanish and Portuguese, you would notice that there are some words that look or sound the same, but they are definitely have a different definition. So here with Scots language, I just had to go and figure out what the heck they meant by the Scots language. The Hippocrene Dictionary gave a nice history lesson about the Scots language. The Scots language is a descendant of the Anglo-Saxon language that was brought to Britain when the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes invaded the land at the end of the Roman period. The Angles, they migrated into the northern parts of Britain while the Saxons migrated into south along with the Jutes in the south. Ever since then, the language of those two areas developed differently. Just as dialects develop differently, these two languages develop differently. What do we see from all this? The form that arrived in northern Britain, of course, took a different route than what they spoke down in the south. The Saxons certainly developed their own language. Separation pretty much creates their own unique qualities, just like with any of the Romance languages and their separation and differences. With Scots, one need but just look at a lot of the poetry and the songs that have been produced in the Scots language. There are a few of those. One of them I'm going to demonstrate for you how it demonstrates how Scots is different, even though you will probably understand a few words that are in that song simply because the languages are related. And today, if you talk to people in Britain, you will actually find that there is kind of an argument going on between whether or not Scots is a language or whether it's just a dialect of English. I'm one of those of the opinion that it is a language. I am simply finding myself coming up with the best arguments that I can in order to preserve the language because it is kind of fading out in a lot of places where it used to be spoken, but there are enthusiasts who are pushing to keep it going. One of the things that was written in Scots was an epic poem called The Bruce. If you were to read this poem called The Bruce, you would definitely see the differences between what would be English and what we know as Scots. Later, of course, other things were translated into Scots. There's actually a Scots Bible that was translated a long time ago. There were actually other later instances of translating the Bible into Scots as well here within the last century. 
And I was able to get my hands on a New Testament, though I have yet to find a complete Bible in that language. If you look for some things, you will notice that the Aeneid was translated into that language, and even the first Harry Potter book was translated into that language. When I was going through the Harry Potter book, I was really fascinated by some of the differences that are made there, besides not only the Scots terminology that's used there that's different from English, but even some of the names of the people, places, and the houses are different. Examples of this are things like the the House of Ravenclaw is actually called Corby Clue, and that is because the Scots word for raven is actually Corby, and therefore, of course, they changed the name to suit it. Hufflepuff is Hechelpech, and Slytherin, they just kind of hardened the ending so that there's a, it's Slytherin so that it's a D instead of a TH sound. And instead of the sorting hat, they call it the blithering bonnet. And I find that kind of interesting because blithering, the Scots term blather, blether is gossip or in some instances it could mean nonsense. So if you've ever heard the word blatherskite, that means that's somebody who is constantly talking or somebody who's talking nonsense and of course the bonnet is a hat but the blithering bonnet so the the gossip hat is there to read your mind and to say i know what house that you belong in and that's kind of funny there there's a couple other things that they have in there too that escape me right now but not only do they change some of the wordage because there's there are a few scots words that i think are similar enough to English that they could have used in this book, but they chose a Scots version that was completely different from the English, and that can happen sometimes when you are trying to emphasize differences. Another thing about Scots, of course, is that there are several dialects of Scots itself. So not only is Scots not a dialect of English, but it also has its own dialects. Some of those examples are Lowlands or Lawlands, which is spoken around Dundee. There is what we call Doric, that is up around the Aberdeen area of Scotland. There is an Orkney dialect, there's a Shetland dialect in the Orkney and Shetland Islands, and then oddly enough in Northern Ireland there is an Ulster dialect of Scots as well. When the plantation happened from Scotland where a whole bunch of people from Scotland moved into Northern Ireland, they brought the Scots language with them. In some areas that language is still there and they write their language in what is called Ulster Scots. So they actually make sure that they are writing in their own dialect. I'm still not quite sure if those people consider Ulster Scots a different language from Scots, because that I personally don't believe. Ulster Scots is a dialect of Scots. There are things actually translated into Ulster Scots as well. Region-wise, you can find people writing you find people writing their own materials, their own literature, in their own dialect, which is another reason why Scots is having a pretty difficult time keeping itself alive, because there are a lot of different dialects of it, and if there's no official dialect of Scots, how do you preserve it? How do you keep it around if there's not a standard version to fall back on if someone wants to pick up and read it? I've seen things written in Shetland Scots and Orkney Scots, and the influence that the Scandinavians had on Northern Scots, of course, in the islands is very well noticed if you if you look at it. Because at a time, the Norse people, the Norwegians, and the Danes ruled that area until in the 15th century, the king of Denmark needed a dowry for his daughter, and he ended up giving the islands of Orkney and Shetland to the Scots in order to cover the cost of that dowry. The Norn language was spoken in that region, which was the Scandinavian language at the time. It was spoken in that region up until the 18th or 19th century before it died out, but the influence that it had on the Scots that 
came in there is is very noticeable especially with the way that things are spelled. So going back to written literature in the language or translations into the language, there is something that I want to read to you really quickly out of the Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stain, as it's called here. Someone who was a Scots enthusiast who has this book pointed out some good places to go and find where the Scots can be really pronounced and one of those sections is when Harry Potter comes to Hogwarts and he is going to put on the sorting hat. The sorting hat in Scots is called the Leathern Bonnet, like I said before. There's a poem here about the Leathern Bonnet or the sorting hat, and I wanted to read the first couple stanzas here to emphasize how different the Scots is from the English. Please forgive my choppy accent because I still have a little trouble holding a Scottish accent. How oh, you may not think I'm bonny, but dinna go by wit ye see. I'll eat myself if you can find a bonnet that's smarter than me. Ye can keep your bowlers bleak, your tap hats sleek and brown, for I'm Hogwarts' blithering bonnet and I can tap them all. You can clearly understand what some of that is, but you michte means you might. Smirter is kind of obviously smarter. The way a lot of these things are pronounced, it makes it so that Scots is clearly as different from English as say as say Norwegian and Danish or Norwegian and Swedish and so forth. They all started out as the same language groupings, and then they branched out on their own. The next thing that I want to demonstrate for you is some music. And this is probably the last thing that I'm going to play here because I don't want to go off on too many tangents. But this song is called The Braze of Keely Cronky. And Keely Cronky is where a battle took place between the Jacobites and the English when the Jacobite rebellion was going on. And the song is speaking through the eyes of someone who fought a battle and who was on the losing side. Say kind to you, and he had seen what I seen on the brace of Kerry Cranky. Oh, I fought at land, I fought at sea, at him I fought my hand to you, but I met the devil hand on the on the brace of Kerry Cranky. What I have been, you wouldn't have been say can't you? And he had seen what I have seen on the brazen oh, Kerry Cranky. Oh, the bold pit car fell away a fall, and clavers got a clanky. King Willie's look and come by Kerry Cranky. Oh, there's no shame, there's no shame, there's no shame to swank you. Oh, the source lays on a breeze and the deals at Kerry Cranky. What I have been, you would have been say kind to you, and he had seen what I have seen on the brazen oh, Kerry 
I love that song. It's it's really an uplifting song, but if you knew the background of that song, it's be kind of surprising to you that it's actually a pretty sad song with the subject that it's covering. It doesn't, of course, tell you the history of the Jacobite Rebellion, but it tells you what it was like for someone who had lived through it and survived. There are other songs as well. The first time I heard this song, a woman was singing it, and I actually prefer her version better because the Scots is really pronounced by her. It's This version is really good as well. So whenever you hear someone speaking Scots, whenever you hear someone who is from northern Scotland and who's speaking the Scots language, you'll more understand that the reason why you probably don't understand is because he's actually speaking another language. I certainly hope other people might look into this and might appreciate how beautiful the Scots language can be, and it would be a very terrible thing if that language should disappear from the earth. Like any language, the language is tied up with the culture of a region, and when you remove a language, something always happens to the culture. I did have one experience with Scots spoken in Northern Ireland when I visited there back in 2010. And I was on a tour bus where the bus driver was talking about regional names there in the in the Northern Ireland region. And when the surveyors from Britain went around to try and create maps and mark names of places on a map, they, of course, thought it would be great to incorporate the names that the locals called it. Up there around Carrickareed and the Giant's Causeway, there are several places that had Scots names. Every time someone asked them, what's the name of the place, they do off a Scots name. And they'd be going, uh, what's that? And of course, can you spell that? And of course, they couldn't spell that because they weren't writing back then. Some of the people that did write in Scots were down in the Belfast region, but Scots was frowned upon back then in in a lot of places during the, I guess I'd say, the middle colonial period. Because at first it wasn't really hammered at because it was part of King James I's colony. The snobbish English who think that it's their way or the highway, their English is the best in the world, they were working hard to eradicate it, but luckily they did not destroy it. Therefore, we now have poets like Robert Burns who wrote in that language, and so we not only have things translated, but we also have things that are written in that language that are original and that people can listen to, read, and appreciate. So that's what I have to say about the Scots language. As always, if you have any comments that or questions that you have about this, feel free to write and ask me about it or tell me what you think. This is Richard Arlen Blake, who is associated with Balladisha Nish, the podcast, and I felt that this individual Scots podcast was a good idea because otherwise I'd be taking up half of one of my shows just talking about Scots and how much I enjoyed listening to the language and studying the things that are written in that language. Any comments or questions you have or ideas, email me at folklorenow33 at gmail.com. And I look forward to talking to you next time on my next episode of Ballad Ishanish or my next reflection into the cultural spheres. Have a wonderful day.